Hey everyone, welcome to Knoxville Studio Tours. Today, I'll be visiting Travis Wyrick at Lakeside Studios. Travis Wyrick is a producer in Knoxville, Tennessee, known for his works with P.O.D., Pillar, Disciple, and Dolly Parton, just to name a few. He's been nominated for a Grammy twice, and he's won several Dove Awards. I've known Travis for a while now. I actually did my internship with him earlier this year, and it's always a blast whenever I get to see him. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoy. Hey, how's it going? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> how's it going, Travis? What is happening? What's <laughs> up? Good to see you, man. Hello. What's up, man? Yep, Hi, this is good Wayne. to meet you. What's happening? Good to meet you. Yeah, it's kind of much. funny. We found this old cassette tape from 1992 of my band live uh, in Little Rock, Arkansas, mm -hmm. opening up for Bad Company. I didn't even know it existed. Someone gave us a cassette, so I'm trying to like fix the cassette. So, that's mm -hmm. kind of so this is with Sage. This is my right? band Sage? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, for 1992, a cassette off the board, a cassette 30 years later, uh, 40 years later. Sheesh! The fact that it even played was shocking to me. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the fun part of it all. I'm gonna call it more trouble. So you said this was opening for Bad Company? Yeah, we toured with, uh, I don't know how to spell trouble. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Yeah, we <laughs> toured enough. with Bon Jovi, Bad Company, Steppenwolf, Peter Franton, in the glory days, I mean the 90s, back when, you know, that type of rock was, was you know, the thing. Um, mm. We were a poor man's Van Halen. We loved, you know, Led Zeppelin, Aerosmith, those kind of bands, so, Tesla. So that's kind of where I got my start in all this was just, obsessed with music i wanted to be in a band i wanted to know all things music and i actually just started recording as uh, just a really a way to process my songs i never ever thought i would enjoy the gear the technology the engineering i was just hitting record just because i needed my band's rec uh, demos done and we had zero money so mm -hmm. yeah i bought a four track uh probably when i was 15 um, and start recording. So, yeah. And then here it is now. This is my yeah. track now. Yeah. Yeah. I'd never intended on doing this for a living. True story. Yeah. Mm. Matter of fact, the first band I recorded kind of had to really persuade me to do it. They were like, come on. You know, I was like, I don't record bands. They're like, please record. You know, and I'm <laughs> like, no, that's not what I do. And then they said, well, we'll pay you. I was like, okay, wait, what's the name of your band? <laughs> <laughs> the moment money's not. That's right. Like, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I think I read um, you did that first album. People really like thought it, or was it an album or you did one well, song? Well, the first one, the first band was a band called Mail. They were a Christian band. Um, and I had just, uh, I was out of this band, the only band I'd ever really been in, uh, my band for 15 years. And I was teaching guitar and kind of thinking what my next move was. You know, was I going to go to some music school and learn a bunch of music theory that's not going to help anyone in the world, you know? Mm. Um, and this band came to me and said, uh, yeah, I had recorded our local, you know, my band stuff and they liked it and they were, you know, they liked my band and they were like, Hey, would you record us? Uh, I'm like, well, no, I don't have the, you know, so well, you did you, why wouldn't you, you know, and I've started doing the math going, well, I guess I could. Mm. Um, and the band was called nailed Scotty Hoagland, great guitar player, great singer. Uh, and they were kind of more edgy and modern than my band because, you know, they were 10 years younger than us, at least. And they were doing the alternative-y, you know, a little more scream, you know, scream, not screamo, but, you know, pre-grunge grunge. grunge. Mm. There you go, I just made up a term. <laughs> new category. Uh, new superpower unlocked. Um, and so I did the record and it turned out really good and they got signed. And then I did another band. My second band, third band I ever recorded was Disciple. Mm. And of course, y'all know their story. They, they, you know, we went on to do huge things with them and that really launched my career. So Scotty Hoagland and Nailed really encouraging me to record them uh, is what got me started. And I'm glad they did because I'd never worked with other artists. I'd always worked with my band members. So for me to sit down with another singer, with another personality and another skill set, and it was just interesting to go, okay, how do I get this guy to perform at his best? You know, or how do I get this drummer to play, you know, and coaching the band up. And, you know, they were just 
happy to be there. It was just really neat. So yeah, and then of course, Disciple. You know, that first record is the, you know, what was I thinking? Which is a pretty, you know, mm. especially to the old school Disciple people, that's the record. And I'm telling you, man, <laughs> it, I I wish there were pictures because I mean. I had the drum set up in the living room. I had headphone lines run out the upstairs window into the screened-in porch just so I could hand him headphones. Had all the mic cables running up the stairway. And, uh, yeah, it was a great record, you know, and it was the start of, uh, you know, the next chapter for me. So uh, so you were just doing all this in your living room? All this in my living room. Well, I had one, the, <clears throat> the third bedroom of an apartment had the mixing board, analog tape, I want to say the first Disciple record was 16 analog. I was 16 analog. And you know, you got to understand an analog 16 machine for just a kid to have, especially a broke kid who, you know, only income is guitar teaching. That was a huge purchase. I think I paid five or 10 grand for that thing. Mm -hmm. But it was an analog machine, which was a wow, you had 16 tracks of analog. You know, back then there's a huge deal. Of course, a computer could do 100, 200 tracks without even thinking about it. But back then, you either had a tape machine or you didn't record. It's really just, and so we did that one, 16. Um, I eventually bought a 24 track from Canada. I paid probably $17,000 for it, which again, you know, you're like, but again, these are like, this is your dream car. So, uh, um, and what kind of uh, tape machine was that? Do you remember? It was a Tascam. I still own it. It's actually, I donated it to the local uh, college here. Um, uh, it, it's kind of an archive piece, but it's also a, they hook it up and they, they have an API console and I'm on the, uh, uh, the, the advisory board for the college. And I talked to the head guy there. I said, Hey, I've got a tape machine, you know, cause they're huge. And I knew this, when I built this 22 years ago, the tape machine has never been in this studio. Um, so I, I took it to them. I lent it to a buddy of mine for a couple of years, uh, Victor from Place of Skulls. He's real into the retro tape things and everything. And was that at Pellissippi? Yeah, because I know they have. An yeah, API there you board. go. That's yeah. my tape machine. That's the awesome. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that before. I want to get a little plaque <laughs> that said, "Don't you you break it, you buy it," or you know, something cute. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I've actually might, seen that. You good. good? Hey, baby, you okay? Hey, are you blocked in? Yeah. yeah. I keep okay, going. we're coming. Yeah. Anyway, mm -hmm. so back to Disciple. So that you know, they kind of took off, and we actually. We did a few records with that, but at this time, I was doing a ton of bands at this time. It would have been an early version of Shinedown, which is a band called Dreve, which were the local, you know, BAs around here. Uh, Ten Years was was starting to really take off. Uh, Copper, which is, you know, phenomenal band with Keith Wallen in there, who uh, is in um, uh, Breaking Benjamin. Mm -hmm now has been for eight or nine years it's got a solo career right now, right now that's doing phenomenal but yeah so it was weird i mean it was almost like i wouldn't say i fell into this but definitely my passion turned into a career and so in hindsight of that because again i wanted to be a poor man's eddie van halen or jimmy page or jimmy hendrix and i guess at the end of the day i just was so passionate about all this stuff that people wanted to share my passion with me, which was making records. So in after saying, thinking all that, I really preach to my kids and my artists and everything is, man, go with passion, put passion in the forefront. Because it's easy to jump out of bed and get ready to go if you're passionate. If you're chasing income or status or trophies, it's just, a, it's a boring way to work. Mm. And you know, again, once you get into the passion, then you figure out where your revenue streams are and how that all works. Um, but again, passion, is, you know, my daughter's chasing music right now, as you know, and she's very passionate about it. And, you know, there's great paying gigs and there's gigs that end up costing her money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to understand, as she does, the gig that doesn't pay might be the better gig for your career. Mm -hmm. um, and the one that pays is going to pay your rent. But then once the gig's over, it's over, you know. And so, you know, I think just finding the passion of music and recording and all that, you um, and I got to live vicariously through all my other artists since I wasn't in a band and on the road anymore. I, 15 years on the road is plenty. I mean, I'd, yeah. I'd slept in the back of a truck on top of the PA in Michigan in a sleeping bag a lot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I'm not desiring to do that anymore. Just makes a back pain that much worse. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and we were broke, broke. So I was eating. I had a cooler I carried around and it had tuna fish. <laughs> yeah, you know, we, we were as slow dough as you, you know, because you just, 
again, you're on the road for three weeks and you're just, you got to survive and you got to go, you know, we were trying to grow our market and our territory, you know, obviously mm. pre-internet, pre-everything. So mm. if you didn't drive to Michigan and play in front of someone, they didn't even know you existed. You didn't exist, yeah. <laughs> and that's where today's world's so crazy. You know, there's pros and cons. People complain, but it's like, hey, you've got to take the good and the bad. Some of my bands will complain, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, hey, please understand, you can make a post and 10,000 people can see that you're playing next Friday. Mm-hmm. We didn't have that. And so I know, you know, you get frustrated at technology and, oh, there's 80,000 releases coming out today. Well, then be in the top 10%. Make your stuff great. Make your stuff accessible. Um, And again, technology is always a two-headed evil. You know, it's good Mm. and bad. It always will be. You know, as soon as we get smarter, then evil gets smarter too. And, you know, and corruption and all that. But technology can also put you in places you could never be before. Some of these records nowadays, um, you know, they're hybrid records where I'm mixing them, I'm tracking them, I'm I'm tracking the guitars and the this, but they're tracking the drums down in Columbia, South America. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or we've got some stuff where they're tracking in India right now. I don't know the name of the town. I'd have to Google it and I'd probably Mm -hmm. mispronounce it. (laughs) But, you know, so then they send me the files and, you know, I would make corrections or connections and re, re... and so, you know, that's technology there too, you know, is, is that's a, that's a plus of technology. I'm getting ready to send, uh, uh, Chris Ford, the Grand Torino boys have a little side project. That's pretty awesome. And we're sending a song to my string guy out in the West coast. He's going to track a ton of strings and give us the files back in the old days. He'd have to fly in or drive in, you mm-hmm. know? So again, technology is your friend. I mean, look at us. We're filming a documentary right now which in the old days, y'all would have been backing a truck up, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, tying in power and stuff. I mean, so. Yeah. Well, and you look at what, uh, uh, I can't remember her name on the point, the green-haired girl. What she and her brother did is insane. Billy Eilish. Billy Eilish. Right? Now, without a, without a Mac iPad, that doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. That, that She doesn't exist. You know, she'd be in a jazz ensemble doing, you know, jack butt. So that again, you know, and some people bark and moan. I'm like, hey, technology's never bothered me. Pink Floyd was cutting edge. Mm. That didn't offend me. Mm. You know, it didn't offend me that they were inventing ways to delay things and sample things. And, you know, I, I'm not offended by technology. Some people just get a little pissy about it. I'm like, no, technology's your friend if you let it be. So imagine telling the Beatles not to do all the things they did. Well, and it's funny because I'll catch people and this was a life changing uh, someone in an an article back when people read magazines. It was Jakey Lee, the guitar player for Ozzy at the time, one of the 32 guitar players he's had. (laughs) And he said, don't wait until, you know, as a musician, our cop out is, well, when I buy that guitar, when I get that pedal, that's when I'm going to do that thing. And he said, that's a cop out and it's a stall tactic in ourselves. And I, I, I thought, I, you said, well, I'll, I'll do that guitar part after I buy this new mic in a few months. Well, no, mm-hmm. do it now because your technology is better than Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles combined for the most part. You know, obviously they had some high end, amazing stuff. It wasn't vintage at the time. It was cutting edge. Um, but if you would have given John Lennon the ability to sit there on an iPad, you know, Imagine, because again, he was only limited by where technology was in those days. And it didn't, you know, and they were they were pioneering some serious techniques that we still use today. It's like um, if you gave Mozart MIDI. Absolutely. Like, yeah, yeah, right, right. Go crazy. Absolutely. <laughs> could you imagine? I mean, could you imagine? So, yeah. And, and think of all the, the little people that were great back then that we never heard of because they never got the opportunity to hand their scores to the, you know, the London Symphony Orchestra and all, you know. So that's what I tell my wife all the time when I'm watching, you know, social media. I'm like, you know, this is an outlet for just normal people. And I take it from the humor. Like I've I've sifted through my social. There's no politics. I delete and unfollow anyone. Mm-hmm. Mine's funny <laughs> and it's weird. And it's, you know, there's a lot of cool, and a lot of guitar stuff and gear stuff, you know, as I want it to be hiking in the Smokies, you know, a lot of information and, and groups. But these people that are just funny. Mm-hmm. And I tell my wife, I'm like, you know, 20 years ago, only their spouse would have known they were funny. Yeah. But now I'm <laughs> laughing my butt off because this girl's funny. And we get to, you know, and sometimes they blow up and become, you know, that one comedian, you know, he's a household name now because mm-hmm. he, uh, 
posted something on TikTok and he hates TikTok, but it made his career. Some people know? are just like naturally funny. And yeah, yeah. No one would know unless they have the technology to just broadcast it. Yeah, and, it, and it's a window to the world. I mean, that's exactly what it is. If it's okay with you, would you like to start going over yeah. some of the stuff we got here? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. A, so it's a lot. So. <laughs> yeah, right. So, you know, in the old days, you'd see that big mixing board. And, you know, I used to have one in the old studio. The cool thing about today's technology is instead of having one brand name mixing board, um, I've got multiple types of sounds and creativity devices. So these are Neve 1073s. These are the real ones. Like these are the ones you hear about. They're not reissues. These, I bought them 25 years ago, maybe 30. And they're worth probably 20 grand a piece. I got three of them. They're real. Now, I didn't pay that for them. They're vintage. They're amazing. Dave Grohl did a documentary on this exact console mm. style. Uh, Focusrite. So in other words, these are the modern day mixing boards. These are channel, 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 you know. So in other words, when I have the whole drum set, those are my mixers. <clears throat> uh, and then over here, everything runs back into, there's a few more channels over there, I guess. But the, everything runs back into this uh, sub snake here and the patch bay. <clears throat> so at this point, Every room, and you know, there's three rooms to the studio. We got the big room, we got the, the real tight room that's real dry, and then the moderately mid live room uh, over here. Uh, and so every piece of gear can get to every room uh, multiple ways through microphones, lines, speakers, all these amps that you see, the heads, all the cabinets you'll see soon that you're in the other rooms. So, in other words, I could have one guitar player performing a big guitar and I can have three different amps really on. I, I don't mind that the world uses the simulators. That's fine. Mm. I just don't prefer them. Uh, I've, I've had to use them at times when people send me the files, but I just like real amps um, and, and I have them too. So they just, they just sound different. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, so when you crank these up and we're sitting here, we get to listen to it at a moderate level, but in that room, if you walked in there, your ears would just start to bleed. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I got a 412s in there, 412s in there. I've got like a Fender combo vintage stuff in the other room. So, so anyway, yeah, so here's all the heads. <clears throat> drum wise, the drum set will be in there. We can go over. So all the drums would be mic'd, routed through here into the preamps routed out of the patch bay into the computer interface. Now this is my computer interface. These are Apogees, which are my favorite converters. It's got Big Ben clock in there, which is some nerd terms if you know what that is. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a great, super, super, super clean mic pre. If you were doing violin or mandolins, they're just so clean. I, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Distressor, you know, is a really cool compressor. And here distressor. is the actual uh, supercomputer in there. See that? Oh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so, and I built that, it's called a whisper room. So when we're in here, you can't, you know, cause it gets so quiet in here. You can actually hear the wind blowing out of the air conditioning vents, mm -hmm. which is peaceful. And again, you want to be able to hear everything. Um, different reference speakers just bought these Focals. They're insane. They really, really, really were worth the money. It's stupid money, but at some point you've got to spend stupid money mm -hmm. in certain categories. <clears throat> These are the big boys for like if the band, like I, I love to track live still. I just, again, you know, love the laptop thing and all that for what it is. But if it's a rock band or a funk band or R and B or a black gospel band, I want to track live. There's just something about when you see a band live that doesn't happen in the studio. So. Usually I'll set everyone up live. And when I do that, I put them on the big speakers just to make it, uh, you know, not obnoxious as can be uh, and not hurt my my babies. Mm -hmm. Now, these uh, is something new, Dolby Atmos. You probably heard about a little bit, you know, surround mm -hmm. sound and, and Dolby Digital has been around forever. But now they've really kind of outdone themselves, Dolby has. I've been working with them on this one because uh, it's such brand new technology. But it's 12 channels. And the way they've done, I won't get too nerdy on you, but the algorithm in which they pull it off is insane. Go Google it if you don't know much about it. I think 10 years from now, everything will probably be in Dolby Atmos, <clears throat> whether we know it or not. And again, that's it's a rabbit hole if you want to go down one day. Mm -hmm. but, but movies obviously do it. There's a lot of cool music that does it. But anyway, it, it's, it's based on 12 speaker minimum. So left, right, center, uh, right, left, the other one's in the hallway up, I set it right here, and then rear, rear, and if you look up, uh, overhead, overhead, <laughs> overhead, overhead, and then a sub there right below you, 
<clears throat> yep. Okay. So it's called uh, 7.1.4. 7 is the actual speakers. They all must match. They all had to be the same. The mm -hmm. point one, the second digit is how many subs you have. I only need one, but if you had a huge home theater, you might be point four, seven point four. And then the next point is the center. Now, Dolby will not authorize your room without a minimum of 7.1.4. So that was an expensive um, uh, certification. Yeah. <laughs> but, and then the, the ceiling, they can be a little, they can be, uh, they have to be matched themselves, but they don't have to match the ones on the ground, obviously. But it's the same design and same company. Okay. But the beauty is they're all isolated. So when I'm mixing an Atmos, I can put anything anywhere. And it it's based on a sphere, if you think about it, because obviously left and right, and then we can use dimension tools to make things feel like they're moving in and out, but they're really in circles in, in Dolby Atmos. Like, so, you know, if in Star Wars, if something's flying from left to right and then circles back, it really does that. And the theaters are doing it now too. They just don't really talk about it. But mm. sometimes you'll be in those theaters and they might have like a 16 by eight by 12, like insane amount of isolation. And again, I won't go down that rabbit hole too much because it's, it's the future. I got COVID first time I'd been sick in 15 years and I don't sit still and uh, anyone mm. who knows me will tell you that. And so I built the Atmos studio. I thought it'd take two to three weeks to learn the technology. Four months later, I was finally <laughs> walking in the backyard with an MP4 encrypted Dolby Atmos file. And I remember thinking, wow, but you can't stop learning. You know, you can't sit yeah. on, you can't just park and go, hey, I've had success. I'm gonna park, I'm gonna stay right here. And so Atmos was intriguing because it was technologically scary. And I had to make all kinds of cliff notes. And I had, you know, because I'd get to a point where I didn't know what to do. I'm stuck. And it's these weird terms that I'd never had to use before. So that was fun. It was intriguing. Anyway, anyway back to speakers. So these are the little baby ones, the reference. They're called Oratones. Yeah, I've seen these in a bunch of studios. Like, yep. It's the mix cube. Right? Yep, they're, they're pretty much like that. They're, now, I had the original Oratones um, and somebody blew them up so i gave them to a friend of mine <laughs> and bought the it's perfect because that the perfect way to say it is if they'll sound good on that they'll sound good on anything the joke is we were listening to the band who was in here yesterday they were listening on their iphone i was like if it sounds good on your iphone we've done something right because mm -hmm. i mean you know that speaker is the size of my eyelash yeah. <laughs> uh and you know and again unfortunately you know, how many times have I walked in and someone's just listening to music with their phone on the couch? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the old days of a guy sitting there in front of his pioneer yeah. <laughs> speakers <laughs> with a brandy, you know, at drinking, listening to, you know, high resolution. And people still do that, obviously. And cars, obviously, the systems are pretty amazing. But, mm -hmm. yeah. Speaking of isolation, how do you get all this put together? <laughs> so this whole thing was a massive undertaking. And I'll find you the picture here. This is the room you're in right now. Oh, really? See the fireplace? Get your bearings. Window, 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 fireplace. Okay. You see that? Isn't that crazy? <laughs> that is insane. So this was a little country kitchen. Yeah. And when I bought the house, it was a, it wasn't a, I, I didn't build this house. Um, so Russ Burger Design, who's a design firm out in Texas, they're phenomenal. They had helped me with the last one and this one, acoustics, because acoustics are like a dead language. Nobody really knows, and when you do know, you gotta go, when you do need to, you know, you gotta go find someone who understands acoustics. Cause there's so many different variables to the concept of just how sound works, travels, absorbs, reflects, refracts. Mm -hmm. So basically what you just said, Russ Berger's theory is, if this is where I am, <clears throat> left and right, he wants a little bit of uh, non-absorptive. So we got bricks here and all this, see that? Mm. So we took the brick fireplace to this because it's spatial, it's it's uh, reflective, and there no two patterns are the same. Flat mm. surfaces are horrible, so you never want a flat surface. If you notice, even the corners, that's the easiest way to remove a corner. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's by design, and so you don't get weird staining waves, you just get rid of the corner. <clears throat> I had one little after fact here. Uh, this, I had a little sound coming off that flat piece. So this was an afterthought, which, you know, Russberg even said, hey, we're gonna do everything right and then we're gonna find something. That's okay, that's every studio I've ever built. But yeah, so the front here, you can see these cuts. They're precision 
and they're calculated exactly like uh, acoustics should travel. Now, having said that, the absorptive material, that's just fabric. Now, if you if I pulled that fabric off, there would be all these crazy kaleidoscopes of this absorptive material called 703. Uh, it's one inch there, it's inch and a half there, it's two inch there, and it's random here. And what you end up doing is you absorb everything. Mm -hmm. I hear that piece of metal. Yeah. Watch. <laughs> That's that little piece of metal back there. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, because again, if you if you hear reflection, then that's not in your mix, that's in your wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I have that issue. Right, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, and I always tell people, just learn your room. Don't turn it up if you don't have a professional studio, because cranking it turns up mm. all the chaos. Just more stuff moving around. Barely. Nick Raskulinik mm -hmm. is a buddy of mine growing up who's had an insane career, and I remember decades ago, we were both talking how we mix, and we just barely turn it on, and I felt good going, okay, cool, because he said, if you can make it sound good, bear if then you've done it right kind of like the phone mm -hmm. thing now you know yeah. but again when you crank it up well of course everything and i tell people these are ten thousand dollar speakers everything sounds good on them. but what's it sound like in your car you mm -hmm. know how does it translate to the world yeah and that's the scary part of home studios is you know learn and you know i did that for 20 years which was my uh inferior studio acoustics and gear and speak whatever You've got to learn it, and the best way to do it is go listen to 15 devices and, you know, wham, that kick drum is muddy and yeah. the vocals are <laughs> killing, you know. And then you eventually just learn to kind of pull the whole thing. Let me get this. I've got a you doctor. Can, we thing. can do a cut real quick. <laughs> well, and it is funny because, I, you know, it, it took me a while to learn that too. Just because th this mic cost $4,500 doesn't mean that this $900 mic doesn't sound better. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I finally had to buy into that. It's not about that. My guitar, that's the cheapest guitar in here. It's 200, 300 bucks. I play it all the time. Mm -hmm. I've got a $4,000 Paul Reed Smith in there. My son plays it all the time. I don't mm -hmm. play it. It's cool. I love it. But I like the, you know, so. That's what's neat about gear is that yeah. they have, like, it's just because they're cheap, that doesn't mean that they don't have characteristics. So. Well, it, and the technology, like I said, you know, with the Bluetooth, you know, in the old days, it was radio frequency. So a good wireless unit was 1500 bucks. Mm -hmm. And this little Bluetooth $99 one, that's, so it's I don't take that. Bluetooth? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's up here in the corner. Yeah, yeah. If this is the one, I mean, I'm assuming it's running off of Bluetooth because you pair them. Oh yeah, that's the one I was yeah. looking at. It's 99 bucks. Yeah. You know, the only problem I have is I bent the little charger, but literally, and so to me, it's fun because if it didn't work, I would just give it to somebody and, oh, well, $99. Yeah. <laughs> you know, didn't break I don't the play live enough to matter. I play shows with my daughter now, which is fun. And then we're doing a Sage reunion, my old band. Every five years we do a, and this will be our 30th reunion since we broke up. That's how old I am. <laughs> we broke up 30 years ago. Mm. So crazy, crazy, crazy. Wait, when's that? Uh, it is October 11th. It's the Friday night before the, Florida game on Saturday. Just really? to, yeah, I knew everybody would be coming in town for the Florida game. Um, and it's an open court. We did it. Oh, really? Yeah, five years ago, right before COVID. You know, like, we literally joked that we were the last concert on earth for like two years. Uh, we played New Year's Eve. And it was downtown. And being New Year's Eve, we had to go on at 10, and it, which was awesome. But, you know, our crowd is not 20. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> You know, they, everybody had to get rooms. It was fun, but I wouldn't. We're just going to do a normal show this time. That way, we can get on. I want to be at Waffle House by eleven fifteen. That's old people goals. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll have to fight to All try my to gear get that shift. Uh, say again. I'll have to fight to try to get that shift. Oh heck yeah, <laughs> yeah. You you down there now? At the yeah, court? Heck yeah. Good. They're pretty nice. Yeah, like and we got Colin Mixon, dude. I'll totally get it. And if you're not on it, I'll pay you to come hang out with <laughs> us anyway. Because again, you know, I got John on Guitar Tech. He's my he's my boy. Uh, Colton's mixing, which is, you know, Colton. You met Colton, right? I think I met Colton, yeah. Great front of house. He does Eric Baker, kills it. it you know, and Eric's a vocal and an acoustic, which, you know, he's, I just remember being the last Eric show going, he's got that vocal just fire, you know? Mm. So, and BG's a great sound of room too, but, you know, still, so. Yeah. Yeah, but I love open court in their setup, and it's always fun there. The it, acoustics one way another, are great. On the way there. Well, so. and, you know, we it's a Western Sizzling frame, so it's got, like, rustic beams in the rafters, nothing sounds better than wood and an A-frame. You know, again, the worst thing you can have are two parallel walls and there's no parallel walls in that place. You know, mm -hmm. Randy was doing some mods. I was like, whatever you do, 
angle this way. You know, if you build that wall straight, you're going to be sad, you know. Mm -hmm. That's the catch with all this is build it the right way. And I could even walk you through some of this if yeah. you don't want to do that. Yeah, for sure. um, so this, again, this house was already here and this was a step down little country kitchen. So the fact that the concrete slabs were isolated is a dream for a studio because vibration is noise, it is audio. So if, if the floor is vibrating, it sounds to you like you hear low end, which you do. So mm -hmm. anyway, we'll go to the drum room first. You can probably barely tell unless you look at this crack, but this wall's leaning forward. See how it's touching yeah. there? because you can't have two walls together. Now, you got a little bit of absorption going on here. So this room's a little bright. Uh, drums sound really good here, and it enables me, I've got a bunch of room mics and ribbon mics and vintage mics I'll set up in the room to capture. Uh, and then the ceiling, what I've got is seven inch, eight, uh, six inch, five, four, three, two, one. And the reason you do that is, if you absorb everything with two inch, let's say we cover the room in two inch. Well, there's only one note on the piano that's gonna go away. And so now you got some weird dip. Mm. This is broadband, it kind of grabs everybody. Uh, the after effect in here was this guy. So this helps everything. This is just a huge face drive, just pack full. But I was getting a little, and glass is usually an ugly thing, but obviously you wanna be able to see. So mm. that was an after effect that really fixed this room up. And you can tell this room is a little bit brighter. So I've got a 412 in here. If I want to keep it a little more old school, like the new rock is more tight, no room. It's just tight. Mm -hmm. So here's a couple of the amps in this situation. Uh, and here's just storage. I think my last just cables and seen this thing. Look at it. <laughs> also, so these are all my drums. I just learned over the years that, um, you know, you bring in your touring drum set, you know, you spend a day just fixing them. So. Mm -hmm. Lester Estelle, one of my just dear, dear friends and one of the best drummers on planet Earth, he's just, he's basically helped me build this collection. Here's actually his risen acrylic. Uh, I'm gonna probably get these wrong because I'm a guitar player, but this is yeah. the maple one that came with a drum set in there. Uh, this is the Chad one that's uh, Chad Smith, but it's, uh, it's a, I think it's a, definitely a metal. This is a real um, Black Beauty. And then a bunch of other ones. And then I got a other Black Beauty that's a little deeper in there. This was the acrylic maple. Yeah, this one, this is a pretty custom. Oh, and this is the snare Lester just sent it to me uh, this year. This was the one we recorded Pillar Bring Me Down with. Oh, really? and, yeah, and it's just pretty, look at that. And yeah. so <laughs> he was getting ready to give it away or sell it or something. And he thought, you know what, Travis loves relics. Yeah. And so he sent it to me and I was like, okay, this is awesome. I knew Pillar fan. Is uh, any of the ones in there, any of them your go-to for like rock records? Uh, it's uh, one on there right now. Oh, That's okay. a Black Beauty and it just slams. The, the other Black Beauty in there is a little skinnier. So this one's got depth, which is popular right now, the deeper. The beef. But that crack from, you know, eight, 10 years ago is the other. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, these are acrylic, uh, not acrylic, these are uh, uh, birch Yamaha toms, which are phenomenal. I've got the Yamaha birch chicken there. Let me make sure. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, if someone took your guitar away, I'd know instantly. If you took drum hardware, it'd take me forever. Yeah. This is a Risen <laughs> Kick. It's an old company that's gone now, but it was custom made for me and it just sat, it's been on so many records. And you could tell we get a lot of like the vintage trippy miking. This is Ryan Williams showed me this trick. He had done Train, Rage Against the Machine. He was here working on the 10 years record with us. Showed me a lot of cool miking techniques that I, because back then our, my, my drum struggled. I, I could, I'm a guitar player, so I could get good guitar tones. I could always work a singer. Um, I had a mix guy that helped me out with bass. Uh, one of my mix guys called me, uh, I'll remember his name, but he just said, hey Travis, you, you, you mind if I tell you what you're doing wrong? I was like, all day long. Please. <laughs> my ego, I checked my ego at the door. I, I, mm -hmm. you know. He said, well, you, you need to do bass this way. And this is this is what everybody else does and you're not, you know, okay, fine, I'm not a bass player. Changed my life and I did it and it worked forever. What was mm -hmm. his name? He's a brilliant mix guy. Uh, anyway, I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll just randomly throw that at you. And then drum-wise, Ryan came in and helped me a ton because, again, he had done some amazing records and uh, changed my life. You know, we got the Neumanns up here. Um, and again, I'll put two ribbons in an XY stereo pattern right here. You know, just so you can kind of grab that whole old school room. You know, back in the old days, they multi mic and room mic because they had to. You had eight channels. So, you know, nowadays I'll put 16 different channels on just the drum kit because I can. 
Now, mm -hmm. I might be in mix and I might mute half of them. But then on the next song, I'm going to mute the other half because I want to go with the roomy, trippy, radio mm -hmm. thing. But on the next one, we're going super tight in your face. So my thought in theory and style is, well, I just record them all now because I don't want to make an executive decision that day. And then later, a month later, hey man, let's run those room mics a little hot. Because mm. some people, music is cool because there's no right or wrong answer. Some people love roomy drums, some people hate roomy drums. Some mm. people love click attack on a kick, some people hate it. And my job, and I, what I tell everybody is, I just want the client to be happy. If you love it, then I love it. Now, I'll sometimes beg to get my opinion on something and go, hey, trust me. And if you hate it two days from now, I'll redo it your way. But sometimes mm -hmm. I'll just go, that's something I would want to see if I can talk the artist. Try to guide them a bit. Yeah, because yeah. again, we come in with one and then we leave with a record and my goal is where they, I love when people say, I never thought this record would be that good. Mm -hmm. I see people in there crying when they're hearing it. That's not a me thing. It's just uh, all the experience, all the session players, all the people that have, you know, we just all come together. And two, a lot of these artists is make sure you're here to take the time and the energy and the preparation to make the record that you've always wanted to make. Mm -hmm. I turn a lot of people away because, hey man, we got $13 and we want 32 You know, I'm like, wrong guy, won't you, you know, <laughs> even hear it. Hey, I wish you well. Uh, who do you recommend? I don't recommend anybody because if you recommend somebody, now you're on the line if they're unhappy. Mm -hmm. They'll call you back six months later. Hey, remember when you, I'm like, oh. so I don't recommend <laughs> anybody. Um, you know, go find that $13 recording studio, but mm -hmm. you know. The, the beauty too is I've kind of, I'm a little pricey because um, I got a lot of gear and a lot of overhead, but I've also got it to where I can go pretty fast. And I always say, you want to make your record, you want to save your budget, let's get smart. Mm -hmm. Let's get efficient, you know, you know, and it's not even, you know, learn everything note for note. Don't over rehearse. I hate when bands over practice because they come in here and it's like, take number 782 and I've, I'm hearing the song for the first time. <laughs> Some of the cooler songs on the wall in there uh, are the ones that were written while we were tracking the record. Mm -hmm. You know, some pretty famous ones too, which I thought I always think is pretty cool. But so anyway, in this room, which you walk through the front, this is just the rollover room. We call it the think tank, and uh, it's a little dark in here. But this is where artists can go. It's I like typically this yeah, it's just a cool vibe. It's probably almost on. Let's we'll see if it auto kicks in. Yeah, yeah we do. I would have killed to have something like this as a kid. Right, up, right. You know? Well, and it's funny because we finally got it where I've got it where I, I bought a new Mac because Macs are like eight hundred bucks now. <laughs> yeah, like, apparently. Our four thousand dollar one's dying. I go to buy a new one, sick to my stomach. I'm like, honey, they're eight hundred dollars now. This is an M2 processor. Anyway, mm -hmm. so this is a room where like if I'm in there working with a singer for three days, the the bass player can come in here and I'll set him up with the real drum performances and he'll play them and practice. You know, it close the door and he's just on his own little world. Uh, that's the way y'all came in, if you remember. Mm -hmm. we, get, we get spun around. I got a real <laughs> B3 here. This is pretty cool. He inherited this from a mission group I worked with. I was working with some uh, like mission work, some inner, inner city kid stuff, and they bought a building and we were converting it into a studio downtown. It was a really cool ministry. And we're walking through, it was an old uh, funeral home. Mm -hmm. And we're walking through and we're trying to decide where everything goes. And I, I saw that. He goes, oh, don't worry, that'll be gone. I was like, they're hauling that off today. I was like, wait, don't touch this. I, I went and borrowed my brother's truck. It's a B, it's a C3 cabinet. C means cabinet. Uh, and, yeah. and then he goes, well, there's a box in the other room that it's attached to in the walls. And it was the Leslie, the real one, the double spinny. So I gave that to a buddy of mine, John Folk, and I, I own it, but he gets to keep it forever. That's the way I work. I'm like, here. And he fixed it up, he uses it, and it's, it's the, you know, 1960 mint that condition, is awesome. right? Yeah, so come on in. <laughs> this is just the main hangout room. We've got kitchen and bathroom. And again, this is all for the band, separate access from the house. A um, Little bit of wall of fame in here. Here's first time Dolly Parton came. Mm -hmm. That's how young my daughter was. That's Emily. Oh, really? Crazy? <laughs> and look at this. She, well, I say, she did this letter, and her manager said, Travis, make no mistake, she wrote this letter. If you look closely, you can see where the fax machine, she mm -hmm. still and faxes them and signs them. She's just old school. 
Mm -hmm. And so he said, he was basically saying, this is not an intern. This is a special. I was yeah. like, yeah, I mean, I get, I mean, chills right now just yeah. talking about it. Yeah. So she's been here about half a dozen times now. Disciple, disciple, you know, disciple. Mm. Ten years. Awesome. Connor Kelly's first record. Great record. Great band. P.O.D. Warriors. This was a fun one. We actually tracked this in uh, Palm Springs. I shipped all my gear out there. Uh, there's Copper. There's the guy from uh, Breaking Benjamin. Phenomenal guy. We always knew he was going to end up something mm -hmm. and the breaking benjamin gig is ben's been great to him he actually has a solo career now so ben actually lets him do his own thing and be and they don't run tracks man they track up um, ben's with the real deal that he does all the harmonies like they don't run any production track mm -hmm. uh killer disciple this is a pretty pretty well-known pillar uh dear amanda which is eric baker's two records ago Oh, yeah, that's live. Uh, Jagstar, Disciple, Grace in Motion. Andy Wood's first record. This is awesome. 10 years, yeah. Oh, that's the big boy. I think, oh yeah, okay, there you go. I was about to say, I think we have the EP. Yeah, so I think fans would flip on the 2002. Oh, there's that CD. Yeah, how, how cool is that? Though? Great great guys, man, and they are still killing so, it. Still did you get it. some awards for the Disciple and Pillar, right? Yeah, so that would be here. So uh, Christian uh, Community does Dove Awards. Yeah, Dove Awards. Yeah, That's which is like a Grammy for Christian. So I've, I've been blessed with four of these. Uh, three of them are Pillar, and one of them is Disciple. There's the Testify record, P.O.D. That was an awesome, mm -hmm. fun experience. Uh, Grizzly, oh, two Grammy nominations. There we go. Yeah, my bad. Uh, Pillar of the Reckoning. Yeah, that's it's probably Lester's favorite record by Pillar, and I, I think it's it's phenomenal record. Uh, it was a tough record to make. They were they had been successful for quite a while, which is hard. Yeah, and you know <laughs> it, it's weird because sure. oh, it's like no, 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 no. Success is hard. Mm. Everyone wants a piece of you. Everyone needs you. You're depleted, your your marriage is in a place, your relationships are, and the labels and management are beating you to death. <clears throat> and that's when we made that record. And uh, we were all in a hard place, And uh, but it's a great record and they, they killed it. You know, because sometimes when you're in that headspace, you, you create the best art, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, Charlie Daniels, this was an awesome one. We have Rick Skaggs, uh, not Rick Skaggs. Um, yeah. Um, this got nominated for a Grammy also. So those are my two Grammy nominations, which is just a super, super cool honor. Here's my Eddie Van Halen picks. These are real Eddie Van Halen picks. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, isn't that funny? I like this. Is, awesome. Everyone loves, everybody takes a picture of this. You cannot start the next chapter of your life if you keep oh, yeah. rereading the last <laughs> one. It is funny. Uh, I was going through a tough time and, and I, I think someone gave me that. And uh, it is really connected with a lot of people. It's usually sitting up here. Uh, I set it down there for some reason. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, Stop let's continue. Easy. Oh, and here's the funny thing. Gotcha. I've done over a thousand records. See that bag? Those are the ones yeah. I hadn't framed yet. Oh. <laughs> and remember, people can quit do doing CDs, what, four years ago? So I probably never framed them. <laughs> Oh, here's some more stuff. Okay, cool. More more uh, Disciple. Disciple had a ton of number ones. I think we've had over 30 between Disciple, Pillar, Spoken, 10 Years, all that kind of stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, I think 22 nominations for the Dove Awards, which is pretty cool. Now, here's Vinyl. Everybody loves Vinyl. Mm -hmm. Everybody's getting their Vinyl on. Uh, oh, there's some more records over there. Here we got Pillar. Letter Black, love Letter Black. Super Chick was a good one. Oh, there's a there's the newer Pillar one. Since October, man, great dudes, great record. Uh, probably one of my favorite bands that didn't get. They should have been bigger than they they got, but they they did great. But they were really really good. Uh, Inhale XL, super killer band. Uh, this almost Ramajet almost made it to the final Grammy and then place the skulls. There's Green Torino, that's a killer record. We're actually working with a couple of these guys on a side project right now. So, guitars everywhere, as you can see. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, here's some cool pedals, vintage pedal, Keely Mod pedals, you know, just kind of guitar world, a bunch mm. more guitars. Uh, oh No Fiasco is awesome. It's one of the best female singers I've ever recorded, Lindsay. And then this is, as you even walk in here, you'll feel it. Like it that's starts to just go. <laughs> 
and I love this because <clears throat> if I put a mandolin in here, man, it just hears mandolin. You know, it's not here in sheet rock. Or, you know. So acoustics in here, mandolin. I love vocals. Most of my vocals are tracked right here. As you can see, they can see me. So just in case I'm cueing them or conducting mm -hmm. them. And I think, you know, five hours in this room will get lonely. So that way they can watch me. Yeah. Watch me eat. I remember the sandwich. first time uh, I saw you record vocals, you're doing a bunch of movements and cues to them. I you thought you were going crazy. <laughs> I didn't know there was a TV in here. <laughs> yeah, and they're waving and he's like, man, yeah. this guy's insane. He's got way too much pre-work. Where he's like way too into it. There's right? a workout room in here uh, for the artists. And it's funny because I think I, Devin Young could probably tell you more. I was working out this morning. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> people like to write in here and uh, Kevin will just sit here, lay on his stomach and just write right here. Yeah. Just, yeah. I want to say after the world, I, he might remember, but there was a few pretty big songs that he, he wrote right there. So. <clears throat> and that concludes episode one of Knoxville Studio Tours. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content like this. I will be doing more studio tours in the future, so stay tuned and I'll see you guys in the next one.